There are a lot of people with opinions about gender, but today we science, and I hear you do some sciencing now and then, Vanessa. You could say that. Ah, <sighs> science and feminism. I never thought I'd see the day where they would come together. This should be interesting. Hi, I'm R. And I'm Jay. And in this video, we get to hear Vanessa Hill from Braincraft talk to Lacey Green about brains and gender differences. Enjoy. Lacey here with Vanessa Hill of PBS's Braincraft. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. We have very high expectations, Vanessa. Science was promised. Please don't disappoint us. Thanks for joining me. So the old saying goes, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And there's a lot of debate about this, right? Is there such a thing as a female brain or a male brain? Well, it's difficult to categorize a brain as either male or female. So let's say you cut a brain open and you look at two parts, you wouldn't be able to say if it was male or female or even from a transgender or gender neutral person. Right. There's a small difference in one of our areas of the brain, the corpus callosum. It connects your two hemispheres and it's slightly bigger in women but we can't really infer anything on how your brain functions from that. Well, some researchers might disagree with that. It's not conclusive, and it is a stretch to say that anyone can look at a brain and determine a person's gender or sexual orientation at this point in time, but research is definitely indicating that there are biological differences. For example, a 1997 study from the International Journal of Transgenderism showed a very strong link between the volume of the central subdivision of the bed nucleus of the stria terminals, or BSTC for short, and transgender individuals. The study showed a smaller volume of BSTC in female subjects compared to the male counterparts, as well as a significantly lower volume in trans males compared to heterosexual males. But there are also some basic differences in brain structure between the genders. For example, brain blood flow, hippocampus volume, the size of the amygdala, the ratio of white to gray matter, the connectivity of neurons, and a few others. Admittedly, these differences are not all conclusive, but the fact that these findings exist means that there is at least a serious debate to be had. So I'm going to be expecting a very strong case for you to claim one side is right. But even if we ignore the structural differences of the brain, we need to acknowledge that human biology is made up of many connected systems. Hormones are regulated by various organs and have significant effects on the rest of the body, including human behavior. There is no debate in regards to the difference in hormone levels between the sexes. So at the very least, you can't argue that there are no differences in behavior between the sexes due to biology, just based on what we know of hormones alone. So if there's no such thing as a female or a male brain then, what's going on with differences that we see in people's behavior? That's actually a good question, Lacey. How can we account for the significant differences in gender-specific behavior, which we see across the globe in every remote civilization if it's not a combination of biology and environmental factors? Because we wouldn't expect to see similar traits between gender norms of, let's say, women in the developed West with tribal women in the Amazon, if there wasn't at least a small biological component. So the differences we see in people's behaviour are mostly a result of our environment and not our biology. Mm. Which then goes on to produce stereotypes, right? Or in other words, a widely held idea is about how someone will behave because of their gender. Exactly. And reminding people of their gender, of these gender stereotypes, creates something called a stereotype threat, where people tend to perform in ways that just reinforces this stereotype. Well, where do stereotypes come from? Pattern recognition and bias towards grouping of subject categories is my best guess. I have to wonder, are you reasoning after the fact? Because it seems to me that stereotypes exist because of this behavior recognition within a subject group. But you seem to be saying that the stereotype itself influences people's behavior within the subject group. I'm not saying that stereotypes don't reinforce behaviors, but I doubt they're exclusively derived from environmental factors, as a good case can be made for biological influences on behavior. The origin of many stereotypes is likely just pattern recognition of the common behavior seen within a group who share common biological and environmental factors. So while we shouldn't by any means act like stereotypes are a hard rule, we also shouldn't encourage people to strongly steer away from these stereotypes because that is equally as influential on their environmental behavioral development as the stereotype itself. We shouldn't be actively influencing a person's behavior to suit any agenda. Let people behave as they like, and if that behavior falls within a stereotype, then so be it. For example, many studies have found that males and females perform similarly in math tests, but when female students are asked to report their gender at the top of a math test before they start, their performance is worse. Finally, some science, or 
kind of. There is a problem with what people are concluding from this study. If the girls were performing fine until you enforced a gender identifying factor into the study, then the bias did not exist prior to the introduction of that factor. This is evidence that the bias was enforced onto the subjects. It's unlikely that the subjects were unaware of their gender prior to the test and only realized that they were a boy or a girl when asked. The influence of making the girls acknowledge their gender only infers that the act of making them acknowledge their gender is a source of the bias. This would not have occurred unless unnecessarily prompting the girls to acknowledge that their gender was of importance to the test. It is also important to note that the study did not just involve ticking a box to identify gender as you seem to suggest. It included an exhaustive list of questions from racial identifiers to gender and perceived maths ability. For example, do you think boys and girls are treated differently at school was one of the questions. This line of questioning is indicative of a potential observer effect. Asking the children to identify their gender and then hinting at possible discrimination of the genders is going to affect their self-perceived ability in regards to their gender. Now, even if I accept the outcomes of this study, the outcome seems antithetical to the values of intersectional feminism, which is obsessed with identifying and defining different groups. Defining people into different groups in the study was associated with reduced maths performance, as opposed to just not discussing their gender at all in relation to maths. So basically, just like the math stuff, we're seeing how people's gender-based attitudes are creating real-world differences in girls' performance, but also their interests and their behaviors too, right? There's something called implicit bias that comes into play in a big way. Now, implicit bias is our bias that we have in our judgment and behavior towards people that we don't even realize we have. Right, which is really sneaky. Yeah, it's very sneaky. In fact, it's almost subconsciously sneaky. And the fact that everyone has some form of bias should indicate that it's a natural part of human behavior, which stems from our biology. That's why we use science in an attempt to objectively determine if a perspective is correct or if it's just implicit bias. So I hope there's some science on the way. Even people who are super aware of it, we're not immune. We're not immune to these influences. In the 80s, some orchestras introduced blind auditions, where candidates would audition behind a screen to conceal their gender. Following this, the number of female musicians in the top five orchestras in the United States jumped by 20%. Oh my god. I actually find that quite interesting, but it's hard to prove much from that finding. As much as you could claim that the people conducting the auditions had a positive bias towards males, someone else could claim that females perform better when they don't worry about how they are being physically perceived. This doesn't necessarily prove bias against women. It could actually just demonstrate that females perform better under different conditions to males. Understanding this, you can't attribute that difference to sexism without further investigation. And it's not just a gender thing, either. This spans across various social groups as well. Yeah, it does. And there's actually studies that have looked into tipping in restaurants. And in a lot of them, they found that both black and white customers in restaurants tip white servers more than black servers, even when people rated that they were happier with the black servers' work. I have no doubt there is some racial bias floating about, but the question we should ask is, how impactful are these implicit biases, and how are they relevant to reinforcing gender or race stereotypes? The study you linked has some major flaws, one of them being it uses a sample size of 321 white servers and compares that to a sample of only 73 black servers. This does not make for an ideal statistical analysis, especially if you want to control for other variables. There is also the issue that the study only showed a mean discrepancy of 1.16% in favour of the white servers. This difference wasn't found to be statistically significant and given the large differences in sample size, it's hard to claim that the result is impactful. Another issue in this study was a lack of control in terms of bill size. Black servers waited on customers with an average bill size of 9.5% more than the white servers. This could just indicate that the customers simply tip at a lower percentage when the bill is higher. What this boils down to is that this particular study presents no useful information in regards to racial bias within the service industry. But even if this was a perfectly executed study which showed a clear statistical difference and solid proof of racial bias, I have to ask, how do you expect to counter this implicit bias? Should people just tip black servers more purely because they are black? Anything you could enforce to fix this bias would only replace the original bias with a new one. This actually reminds me of the elections too. I don't know if you're following it, but there was recently this big outcry again that Hillary is always screaming and shouting when she's just talking. And to me, that says that gender stereotypes have a huge effect on how we perceive what's going on in front of our very eyes. 
Name a politician who doesn't get criticised on their mannerisms. Hillary just happens to get criticised on her shrill voice. If anything, this just outlines your bias towards female victimisation. Huge amounts of criticism are thrown at all political figures. I don't perceive criticism towards the demeanours of male politicians as sexist criticisms. Women typically have higher voices than males. Hillary sounds really shrill a large portion of the time. That is literally just describing the characteristics of her voice. People made similar fun of Ted Cruz because of his voice. If you have an annoying voice as a politician, regardless of gender, people will make fun of you for it. Crying foul when it happens to be a woman just indicates your bias. Yeah, and to me that seems really unfair because when you think about it, all of the candidates perform in the same way. They behave in the same way. Yeah, and some of them even yell war. All of those politicians get made fun of for different reasons. Seriously. Every single one of those politicians has a large amount of personal attacks thrown at them, yet people don't cry sexism then. So why is it sexism when it's against Hillary? <laughs> I kind of think that we keep looking for differences in this research because we kind of want it to be true. Mm. Instead, we keep trapping ourselves in these gender identities that we've created and they're continually reinforced by our implicit bias. I'm glad you can acknowledge your own bias, but it kind of undermines all of the evidence you have just put forward. If you look for the existence of sexism because you hope sexism exists, then that taints the interpretation of the study. With that in mind, a lot of the research quoted by feminists does seem to be extremely biased towards the existence of sexism before the study is even conducted. Real science should just be investigating the nature of reality that we find ourselves in. Research shouldn't be conducted with the intention of finding a specific outcome. This is really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge of with course. us, Vanessa. I really appreciate it. And for everyone else out there, you should definitely check out Vanessa's show, Braincraft, which you can find right here. And we'll see you next time. Bye. I'm genuinely surprised at the poor level of scientific understanding presented in this video. I've seen some excellent videos on Braincraft. I was expecting something a little better from you, Vanessa. The only conclusion I can come to is that Lacey fucks up everything she becomes involved with. That video was extremely unscientific and just reeked of intersexual bias. I guess scientific literacy and feminism don't mesh well together. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for weekly videos, like this video, and share it around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.